Hey you. So I was thinking today about process and I want to walk you through a little bit of my process if that's all right with you. And everybody's process is different, but I mean like what is your prophetic process? What is your process with God? So God will break through any process that you have, but I just want to help you out a little if you're newer, if you want to try out like this way or that way or the other, I'm going to tell you sort of where I am. For the most part, I spend most of my time with God anyway. So it already puts me in sort of an interesting space because I'm already there and I'm already close with God all day. I'm in full-time ministry, so that means when I sit with people, it's about God. When I get off work, it's about God. And my family, my children are great at being preacher's kids, which is a very hard job, harder than my job. And it's just God all the time, honestly. But I feel like you don't have to be in full-time ministry for your whole day to be God. And I'm not telling you that you can't go to work and you can't do these things and you can't, because you do. You got to go do these things because you got to have a place to live, right? But this is what I like to do when I am in a space where I have a moment and I know that God wants to move, but I don't know what he wants to do, right? So I like to sit in worship music. I like to sit. I like to get along with God. I like to just get in that space where I feel him. Now, sometimes God will completely bypass whatever you're doing. And he does that a lot for me. He does that for a lot of you guys. But if I ever want to sit down and scribe, right? Like scribing, like writing, writing it down. I'm very careful about putting a date on things. And I put a date on things because I've, I've often noticed in all of these years that when I go back, it always seems to be what I was going through the year before. And scientifically, it kind of lines up because science and God do live together quite well if you uh, take time to read studies. And I am a journalist on the other side of uh, my work, so I do read a lot of studies. And uh, science has proven that you can go through the same thing over and over every year. Like you may have the same thought every year at the same time. And so a lot of therapists will teach you to write down what day, what you felt. So you can go back the year before and be like, oh, well, at Christmas, I seem to get upset about my grandpa. Or at this time, I seem to want to go back to old things. Or at this time, and it helps you to push through it without going back to it. But in this case, I feel like because we know that we can have patterns and healing is also a pattern that you can go back and you can say, well, gosh, on November 15th last year, this, 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 and it'll minister to you because a prophetic word is timeless. Don't mean that it's always going to be on the same day that you need it, but it's like if you ever go back and reread your journals, you'll be like, and it still works and it still works and it's still good because his word never returns to him void, right? And so that's something that I like to do. I like to keep dates for that reason. I also like to um, just get along with God and rest. I go on a lot of text fast. And a lot of people do food fast. And I used to teach at my church like different ways to fast because I don't claim it, but I used to deal with a lot of autoimmune things. So people who couldn't fast with food, we would get together and I would teach them different ways that we could fast. When you hear from God or you're in ministry full time, your phone is the hot hub. I don't think about food much through the day because I'm so busy. So I often fast without realizing that I'm fasting. And God will put me through a fast that I don't even realize I'm on. Right? And I'll be like, man, I hadn't eaten like three days. That's interesting. But for me, what's more effective than food is fasting from people. Now, I can't always fast from a congregation, but I can fast from my text. Like, I need this right now. God's like, nope, they need me right now. I need this right now. And sometimes people don't know when to stop. And I don't mean it in an ugly way, but sometimes people just don't realize that you do need sleep and you do need rest and you need your own time with God. And that's okay. And sometimes you may need to take a break from your text. And it's okay for you to let people know that you're text fasting if you are afraid of hurting feelings. But um, I might still love a message or something like that, but God often will not allow me to. And not only is it a fast for me, but it's pointing people away from idolizing the prophetic. And not that everybody that takes me does that. They don't. I just mean that it gives people a space to go to God themselves because they must go to God themselves. And we don't ever want anybody idolizing the prophetic because that's a dangerous place. Right? It's not a good place. Another thing that I really like to do is I want you to look around. I'm going to show you just a little bit of my space. Right? It's not much. But if I go too far, I've got my ring light up. So... 
I buy things prophetically, and I don't really think about it much when I get it. I just get what God tells me to get. I've had these pictures for a very long time. So, I look at things, and a lot of times God speaks to me through things or what I see or a lot for me, he'll speak to you in ways that you understand. Like I, um, like I've written a lot of books in my life, which means I've read a lot of books in my life because if you're a writer, you are a reader and you have a love for reading, which is why you write. You also have a love to write, but I love, I love classics. So we've got little women up here and that ended up being prophetic for me because it reminded me of my ministry team. And every time I look at it now, I see that and I didn't know why I bought it seven years ago. But now I do. I understand it. And um, this right here, it always reminds me to answer the call no matter what. No matter what it is, when it's late and God needs me to do a thing, that it has always been my obedience. And there was something about that color yellow that I just particularly liked and I still don't understand fully. But it reminds me of that song. And it was all yellow. And yellow meant like it was good. It was good memories. Like you have the yellow fade of nostalgia. Things like that. And over here we have uh, Ms. Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. The book was better. It ended differently. I won't spoil it for you, but I like it better than the movie. But um, here we see her all dressed up. And in reality, she wasn't what she portrayed. You remember if you watched the movie, and it won't spoil it for you because it's just uh, how the movie is and how it was. But she decorated herself like this beauty queen, like this um, um, debutante, like this a socialite, and she became one. But deep down, she was running from her past, and she had um, a family that she had ran from, and she was just on the move, and she felt so unlovable that she didn't even name her cat. And when I look at this, like I bought it and you see all these people looking at her and she's just looking at herself and deep down she knows, like deep down she knows there's stuff going on in here. And I love that movie because of that, because I remember times in my life where I didn't feel lovable enough to be myself. And yes, it's okay to reinvent yourself, but she was completely running. But deep down she was a very interesting character, even with the backstory that she had. It made her even more interesting. But um, I am going to spoil the book for you. I'm sorry. So, in the Hollywood ending, the guy's with her. It ends perfect. My favorite movies are film noir. If you ever wonder what I'm doing at night, I'm watching black and white movies. Okay, it's what I do. If I'm not with God, I'm with black and white movies. They're my babies. Um, but this ends beautifully. The cat, they take care of it. Blah, blah, blah. Name the cat, I think, even. In the book... She runs away. They never find her. She moves on because she has met a man that loves her. She don't know what to do with it. There's a quote in the book, and it talks about, he tells her that she believes love is a cage. She agrees with him, you know. And so instead of learning to be loved, and he knew her story and still loved her, and she didn't have to be anything else with him, but because of that, it scared her more. She ran away. She left the cat, and the man in the book feeds the cat for the rest of his life. The girl is gone. And it's a really good reminder, you know, to me about being your one true self. And if you go up, my, my niece Kenzie painted me this, and it says she remembered who she was. And I don't remember who it's by, but she's a lot like me. She's a feminist, but in that way that we just believe women can do anything they want to do like men can, just as authoritative, just as great. And uh, she's a big time reader and you would think that my daughter belonged to my sister and my niece belonged to me because we're very vice versa. But I love my little niece and um, if you go, um, I have a mess, but if you go over here, I have one of uh, a, a very old uh, big band record because my family were musicians and I have Desert Wanderer hats. Used to hate them. Used to think they were ugly. Sometimes I still think they are, but I still wear them. And I remember preaching in one one time, and I was preaching about the desert, and it's the first time God ever had me wear a desert wanderer hat. And he was like, you're not meant to wander in the desert. And although I know that's a lot, there's a little Coke, an old Coke ad here. I've got a lot of stuff. But pay attention to the things around you that speak to you. That's not new age. That's not divination. It's none of those things. God spoke to people however he spoke to them, and Bible says he'll do whatever pleases him. Bible says that he sings over us. Sometimes it might be a song that you forgot about, and God will explain it to you. And um, another thing for me with process is I don't like to prophesy out of emotion because you can't trust it. 
Now, sometimes, especially when it's like a vengeance word and you've been done very badly wrong, like you might still be told to give a word, but God may make you sit on it. So a lot of times when God has had me prophesy and I had an emotion, he would make me hold on to it for weeks at a time until I wasn't in that emotion. So I could go back and see if that was a sound word from God or if that was just me being fleshly hurt or if it was me being spiritually wounded and spiritual anger is different than fleshly anger. Um, another part of process is I don't call people out as fake ever. Um, I don't call people out of their name at any time unless it's manifesting in a life. Like if you have a demon clearly manifesting in your life, like your God is this, your God is that, your God is blah, 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 and they're just blasphemizing everything. That's the only time God allows me to address a person in particular in a negative way. Never allows me to do that. And I think it's because the heart of the Father is in a prophetic word, in anything prophetic. If it doesn't draw back to square one, which is always God, I can't look at that word because I know that God always leads back to himself, right? And it's always point A, back to himself. There might be repentance and, whoa, what have you done? But it's also God have mercy on you, back to God. Or if it's blah, 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 but if you do this and you turn from this, you know, God still wants to use you right here and right now. It always leads back to that. And there's always the opportunity for forgiveness. And sometimes it's a very heavy-handed word. And I have trouble finding the forgiveness in it. And God might say something like, Laura Brooke, I've gave them many opportunities. And it won't be directed at people, but say, like, God gives me a lot of words for um, the sex trafficking industry. Because I work in sex trafficking awareness um, locally and, and nationally. And because of that, I and I am aligned to that in, in that way, that I'm able to get those words. And because those words are so harsh and heavy, sometimes I have to sit on them. And God's like, no. He was like, these people are, it's just evil. It is pure evil. And I'm done and I'm mad and I'm over it. Sometimes he'll let you know he's done mad and over it. But this is a little bit of different kinds of process. Um, also, just always keeping at a place where you keep your heart posture right. And I know people can tell when our heart posture is off. Like you can tell. And you always want to be able to present God in the way that he deserves to be presented. And that's pure. And this is why we don't call people false. And we don't call people fake. And we don't put out public this. And we don't do that. Because at the end of the day, that's flesh. And I like to operate on a David and Saul mentality. Because David knew that Saul had once been anointed, whether or not he was operated in that anointing right now or not. We don't know who God has a covenant with. We can have a guess that we don't feel right about them, but I won't ever publicly, you know, bash anybody. I'm not going to do that. And like I said, unless it's in a live and that's not bashing, if God gives me a word, and he's like, blah, 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 blah. And I hate that because it's such a, like, I don't ever, it's don't anger me. But it'll happen from here to here and it's white hot and my hands will shake and it's his emotions. I don't know how he feels because he only allows us a portion of his emotion. I would blow up like when we are in such good space that we are not um, in God's shoes because we could not handle it. We would explode. I know that was sort of here and there and everywhere, but that's kind of how the prophetic works. There is an order because God is order and he'll bring it together for you. But it's kind of like a scavenger hunt. It's kind of like a mystery. And it's an adventure. It's an adventurous life. And I love it. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. I really wouldn't. Um, but I hope that that helps you a little bit in, in your process. And maybe you have a different process. And if you do, um, I think that's wonderful. Um, but that's just some of my things and a couple of explanations of like how I might interpret something. But everybody has their different and God speaks to everybody in different ways. So maybe you're somebody that loves hip hop or maybe you're somebody that grew up on a farm like me. A lot of times God will speak to me through a farm word. But just always remember like he was with, he was with Samuel in the temple. He was a very familiar voice and people are afraid they don't hear from God. But what they don't understand is God is such a familiar voice and he proves it in the passage with Samuel because Samuel's like, Hey, are you calling me? He asked his friend in his sleep. And he's like, no. He asks again, and he says, it's not me. And then the third time he wakes up, and he sees the Lord, and it's the Lord. And he says, what can I do for you? It was so familiar that he didn't even recognize it as God. 
So always remember that God is very familiar and never discount when God is trying to show you things. The only time that we discount things is when it goes down the way that God doesn't want us to go. And that's anything that we're asking that's not God because that's just a familiar spirit. And a familiar spirit can get things accurate but they don't know the future of things. They don't know what's next and what's going to happen. All they can do is feed off of your emotion. That's such a dangerous space, right? So we don't want to go down any road like that. But as long as we're just like this with God, then everything is open to your interpretation with God. As, as long as you're doing it through the Holy Spirit, as long as you're not using things the Bible tells us not to use, and as long as you're just with one accord with God and your heart posture is upright, you'll know what to stay away from anyway. Um, it's also good to get um, other prophetic people in your circle, but just use discernment because um, sometimes the prophetic can also present with um, like a Jezebelness and not like, doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that it's that's something that comes against the prophetic a lot. And so if anybody has a jealousy about your ministry or jealousy, God will never allow those things to stick around you simply because um, it's not going to wear off on you per se, but it will start making you think twice about, you know, what God's telling you to say. And that's why God will often separate those things. And if you ever notice that in someone, like they get competitive or they need to be always right and better than everybody else, then maybe just um, separate it, ask God to reveal to you, like, and this is why we don't ever call anybody false, because I feel like everybody can go through little periods of patches. And even though that's not something that I can understand, I understand that I've seen other people go through it and it was just really devastating in their life and once they were um, delivered from that, they went on to do mighty, mighty things for God. So just always remember those things and always be praying for people that are in the same place that you are because we all need it. And just know that you're not alone and know that um, you've got a world of adventure right at your fingertips, even if you're just in the corner of your office. <laughs> I hope this helps somebody today. I love you guys. I'm thinking about you. And I hope that you have a good rest of your day. Talk to you later. Bye.